Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. I invite you, before we start our worship service, to have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of life this morning. Thank you for the opportunity as being here as a church family, together to worship your name and to study your word. And now as we start this special moment, we invite you to be here among us and accept our praises that we are going to lift up to you. We pray in these blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, we have four announcements uh, this morning, and I'd like to start with the good part. This week, uh, our, this church got a new member, so to speak. It's Gabriela Ellison Edwards. Yes, and uh, Jerome and Molly's daughter. Uh, she was born 
on Wednesday, she's doing great, as well as the parents, maybe with a little lack of sleep, but they're doing fine. And um, we are very happy as a church uh, of this uh, great news. And Marcy set up a meal train for them. So please, uh, um, if you receive, you probably received the newsletter this week, or not the newsletter, you sent an email just for that, right? On Thursday. There's a link where you can access and put your name in what we will bring to them. And if you want to uh, join us in this meal train, please uh, access that link, the email. If you haven't received the email, please let me know or let uh, uh, Marcy know and we will forward the email to you, okay? Uh, second announcement. Uh, FaceTap is working every Sabbath morning. Uh, we've been there today. We had a, a blessed morning serving many breakfasts. And you know that summer season is very challenging because we lack people. So if you are available or uh, next week or if you will be available in the next few weeks, please uh, reach out to Marcy. We, we really need volunteers for uh, this summer season. Third announcement on, what is the date? July 24th. It's next weekend at 7 p.m. We're going to have a very interesting lecture um, um, presentation at the Fellowship Hall with Jay Perry. He's going to share a few thoughts, a few ideas about the, the correlation between faith and finance. How can you make sure that your finance is according to what you believe as a Christian. So very interesting presentation next weekend uh, at 7 p.m. on Sunday. And last announcement, very special. Le uh, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to invite here Alejandro and his team. And I'd like to ask him to tell us what is going to happen starting on Monday morning. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This, this is my church, so most of you know me already. I have my wife here, Alicia. That you know my three kids already. You know Slara. She's a student here at HVA. You already know Josh. He's a senior here at HVA. And then the, the, I have Katusha and Cadmiel, they are siblings, they are from Florida. Uh, Katusha, she's a student at Washington Adventist University. And Cadmiel, she just finished uh, high school and he will, will start college, okay? And I remember I came to this church one year ago and like Pastor Bruno, he came one year ago and he told me we have to bring more youth and children to this church. So this is one of the activities to make that happen, okay? This, this missionary activity that we'll have next week uh, will bring children to the church. Now, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I don't believe it yet, but amen. There are 40 kids registered for this activity. And I say, where are they from if we don't have 40 here? So amen, because the other churches that we already visited, the kids came from the same church. So I will meet those churches. Jim will help me in the morning to say hello to parents and all that. So we will try to, to make those families to come on Sabbath, okay, to present the gospel and so we can uh, have them here with us. So Flag Camp is fun learning about God. And this week's theme is fearless. So we're going to have different lessons, both in art and the different activities in our worships that will teach the kids how to face a world full of fear and how that we can trust God and he's the one that will make us fearless. We have activities from 9 to 5. In the morning, we usually do sports, games, and our worship. And in the afternoon, we have different field trips to different areas in the lo local area. And then um, we have closing worship. So from 9 to 5, we're full of kids. If you want to come peek at what we're doing, we'll be downstairs the whole week. 
And this is our crew. They do an amazing job so far. Um, we haven't received any negatives. They are full of energy. They're kind of tired because we just got here last night uh, past midnight. But they are usually, we'll, we'll get some sleep by Monday. Thank you so much.
themselves but we're going to move one of the songs Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I am not Miss Charlene McAllister. As the bulletin says, my name is Andrew Williams. And I went to church here quite a bit because I was a student at Highland View Academy over 20 years ago. So um, I'm not too much of a visitor, but kind of how our story is going to go today is I was like today thrown into something. I wasn't expecting to have the children's story, but here I am. So God kind of works in, uh, in strange ways sometimes to fulfill his, his needs and uh, what he has planned for us. So uh, my story is kind of about that and a lot about prayer. Who believes in prayer? Okay. And who likes sports? I really like sports. And my two boys who are up here with you, like sports too, and we really like football. So we um, have never really done organized sports. I did when I was younger, but I haven't for my kids until this year. And we were exploring the option of playing flag football. Has anybody ever played flag football or football? Okay. So we were trying to get into this league that played on Sundays and um, close to our area, and it didn't work out. Well, I had another friend that lived in Delaware, and he sent me a message and said, hey, there's going to be a football league over here. So we signed up, and the only thing I wanted to do was take my boys to go play football. I didn't want to coach. I didn't really want to help out. Well, guess what? My boys are two different, were in two different age groups, and uh, the guy that was running the football league said, I need help coaching. So I ended up coaching two different teams, and uh, I was not planning for that at all. But I think God had his plan, and he wanted us in this area because maybe we could be a witness. 
So we, uh, we started our season and we were playing and things weren't really organized, but it worked out and we were having a lot of fun. So on a Wednesday evening, we had a game and uh, we had finished up the game and it was getting dark outside and I was helping clean up and I got in the car and uh, I was about to leave and there was only a handful of people left and there was this lady who was out in the fields kind of looking around like she lost something. So I put my, put my car in park and I got out and I said, did you lose something? And she said, I lost my bracelet. She lost a tennis bracelet that had like 24 diamonds on it. So to me, that's not very important. But to her, maybe somebody special gave it to her. And it was really a really expensive piece of jewelry. So I said, well, did you pray about it? And she said, I did. So she, I think, believed in God. And I said, well, I'll help you find it. And I think she had looked so much that she had finally gave up. So I started searching this field all by myself. And I knew in my heart that when I prayed to God, I knew he was going to answer my prayer. I had faith that he was going to allow this situation to, be, um, to bring glory to his name because we could express to this lady that I had prayed about this. So I was praying, dear Lord, please help me to help this lady find her bracelet, please. And I kept praying, I kept looking, and uh, I was almost finished where I was searching and I saw this shiny, these shiny little things down in the grass and I knew it. I had, I had faith that God was going to help me find this so I could go tell this lady that God was so good that he answered our prayers just based on this little bracelet, right? It wasn't life or death, but it was an, it was an experience that she could have that she knew that if we turn to God with whatever issues we may have, he could help us. So she was actually in her car about to leave, and I went running over, and I held out her bracelet, and she started crying. She couldn't believe that we found it. And I was able to share that not only with her, but with other people um, that were there, and that they could see the power of prayer, and that God really, truly will listen to us. In his time, he doesn't always answer our prayers the way he wants to, but I can tell you deep down inside, before I started praying, I knew that we were going to find that bracelet just so we could bring glory and honor and praise to his name through that situation. So uh, I think that was, that was pretty amazing. And thank you for letting me share that with you. I am going to share a Bible verse with you. It's 1 John 5, 15, which says, We know that God will listen to our prayers and give us whatever we ask. If it's in harmony with his will, and if we know that he listens to us, we also know he will give us what's best for us. And that's in the Children's Clear Word Bible. So let's say a prayer, and then we'll go back to our seats. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to witness to people, even sometimes when it's not what we expect or what we want. Um, we ask that you will allow us to be willing to work for you and to... Um, Bring glory and honor to your name. We thank you for all that you do, and we ask for a wonderful Sabbath day. Amen. It's now time for the uh, Garden of Prayer, and uh, the fact that you're here today, God has already blessed you with another day of life, um, and now it's, it's our opportunity to, uh, to give back to Him um, ourselves. Uh, you know, it, uh, I've lived long enough to know that I start each day giving my life over to God. The fact that he gave me an opportunity to live that day, I said, okay, Lord, I'm kind of stubborn, so somehow you've got to 
show me what you want for me today. And sometimes I just go through my routine, uh, uh, but God is there. He's with us. He walks with us. That was okay for that day. So uh, I'm just sharing that because life is an experience, but each day we need to start with giving God the opportunity to work in our lives. You only have grace for one day. There's no promise about tomorrow until it happens. So those of you that are able, please kneel as we have our prayer. Lord God, here we are. We ask that you use us to bless others and especially to bless you with our lives today. We thank you so much for the Sabbath, a time that we can come apart from our busy work schedule of the week and, and, and be refreshed. Uh, you were so good in designing the days of the week that way, to just to bless us with a day of rest and a day that we can thank you for being the God of love. So, Lord, be with us today and help us to reach out to others um, and testify of you and what you've done in our lives. And maybe that will be a spark that will help them to, to start a relationship with you. We ask that you be with the school, Lord. Uh, it won't be long before they'll be starting again. Uh, be with the families that are making decisions on uh, sending uh, the students here. Uh, Lord, watch over, keep them safe. Um, Lord, refresh the, the staff the teachers and, and those that um, do administrative work and, and um, help them to be ready to, to serve. And Lord, as always, thank you for loving us beyond a love that any of us can even imagine. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As a church, Highland View Church, we are very, very blessed in many different ways. But especially because we are a multi-ethnic church. We have many different ethnicities represented here. And this diversity is very positive for our church community. And we also have... Uh, Members with many different abilities and activities and very interesting ones. And we, had a, we have a member that had the opportunity of serving for one year as a missionary overseas. And uh, when I spoke with him uh, about a month ago, I told him, we have to share that with the church. Because it's very interesting. We can... Uh, um, Listen to some interesting stories and, and be encouraged to join mission, even not going overseas, but being at, at our place, in our house, in our neighborhood. So I'd like to invite Gabriel to come up front. Um, he spent a very interesting year overseas, and I'd like to ask him a, a few questions. So... Where did you go, Gabriel? So, hello for me. 
Good morning, church. Yes, yeah, so this past school year, I uh, worked as a missionary teacher in Palau. Where's uh, Palau? It's a group of small islands in the Pacific, and it's an independent nation here. Okay. Why did you choose Palau to go? Is there a specific reason? Uh, one of the main reasons that I chose Palau was because of the, the many stories that I had heard before from missionaries that went there. It, at Anderson University, where I attend, there's a lot of people that have gone to Palau before I did, and they told me great stories about it and how, how, wonderful, how a wonderful place it is. Nice. Um, what was the most interesting cultural difference that you experienced during this last year? Well, something very shocking, I would say, was how everybody knew each other in the island. So in the main island, there's a population of, I think, almost 20,000, so it's almost like the population of Hagerstown, I think, something like that. So, and everybody knows everybody, they're all family, so you will see the president walking down the street. I actually got to go to the president's home for dinner. Oh, it's nice. something really shocking, because you, you talk to someone and they say, yeah, that's my cousin, the president's my uncle, something like that, so that's something really shocking to me, especially since I live here in the US. So I only have my parents and my two sisters. And all my family lives back home in Bolivia, so it's really shocking for me to find like everybody's family with everybody. Now I'm a bit frust frustrated because I'm a missionary here and President Biden never invited me for a dinner. Can you believe that? Okay. And um, what were your activities, your responsibilities during this year as a missionary in Palau? So I serve as an elementary school PE and health teacher. So I was teaching kids from first grade all the way to eighth grade. So elementary school and middle school. And not only that, I was also involved, I was actually the designated substitute, you would say. So I ended up teaching every single class. I ended up teaching math, English, everything. So I had to, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> nice, and have you had any, um, interesting or touching experience during this time that you'd like to share with the church? Sure. So, uh, as some of you might know, uh, there, there's a documentary that just came out uh, about Palau. It's something about healing. I just, I just forgot the name. But it's about... Back to Palau? Yes. Yes, Return to Palau. Return yes, to Palau. Yes, yes, That's yes, right. yes. It's, uh, it's about a, a missionary family who went to Palau many years ago and something terrible happened to them, like a person came into their house and he murdered the three people from the family and then only the girl escaped. And so I actually got to meet the man that committed the crimes because we went to prison ministries. And so we got to go to the prison and we, we met the man who did these things. And it was great to see how, how much Jesus has changed him. Like now what, he's one of the most fervent and most, uh, one of the leaders in the church prison, I mean the prison church over there, where uh, he, he leads up worship, songs, and all that stuff. So it's, it's great uh, to see how Jesus can change someone's life. Amen. Amen. Um, have you brought any pictures to share with us? Yeah, uh, as okay. you can see. <laughs> oh, okay. There's some pictures I have done. Like, uh, honestly, one of the best parts of Palau was the kids. They were just lovely, like, uh, hanging out with them, just teaching them. Sometimes they got a little bit annoying, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was honestly a great experience. And I, I would encourage any, everybody, like, if you have a chance to go uh, serve, you should definitely take it, uh, be a missionary. But even here locally, we can all do something. For example, my parents just went to at, where is it called? Faith Step Faith this morning. Step. Yeah. They love to, that's something you can get involved. And so it, whenever you have the chan chance to get involved in missionary work with even your family, it's, it's a great opportunity. Nice. So we had this enriching experience that I, I'm pretty sure that it will change many things in your life from now on. Um, what message would you leave to us as a church based on this experience you had as a missionary, is there any message, a, a final message that you would like to leave to, to us based on this experience you had? Uh, probably the, the best lesson that I learned while I was a missionary is that 
helping others is something that uh, being a missionary and like sharing Jesus' word and just helping others uh, actually ends up helping you the most. Mm -hmm. So it helps you grow spiritually, personally, emotionally. It helps you a lot. So sometimes we do it. We should. Sometimes we say we should do it for others, but it also really he helps every single one of us when we do it. Nice, nice. Okay, that's wonderful. Can you give him a hand? Yes. Wonderful. Praise God for that. And I, I like to uh, close this moment uh, with a word of prayer for Gabriel as he continues his studies at Andrews. But especially for all the missionaries we have uh, spread out through different continents. So let's uh, have a word of prayer and, and intercede for them. Dear God, thank you so much for the blessing of uh, listening to Gabriel's testimony here. We praise your name for uh, the great experience you had, uh, you, you gave him this last year in, in Palau. Uh, thank you for the chance he had to serve that people. And also, as he just mentioned, the great blessing that they were also to him. We pray for um, his studies now as he comes back to Andrews. May you guide him and, and continue to raise this this uh, spark of uh, mission in his heart. And we also pray for all the missionaries, not only Adventists, but all the Christian missionaries we have around the world. Uh, some of them are in a peaceful place, some others in places that they can't even uh, preach publicly. So we pray for each and every one of them. May they feel your presence beside them and may they be a blessing wherever they are. We ask you these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Gabriel.
everyone um, let me pray for you our heavenly father lord help me share your word and please also take care of those who couldn't come today in jesus name amen okay so a couple of days ago i was reading a story of a man that was forced to change his name he was given the name muhammad fari farah but his real name was Hussein Abdi Kahi. He was born in North Somaliland at the age, and at the age of four, his dad died in a civil war. At the age of nine, he was completely separated from his family. Since his dad wasn't there, his mother couldn't fight back and all of a sudden, his mother lost one of his sons. He was given the name of another child and given the name of another person. The woman in front of him t tore all his real name, all his document, and once he was illegally transported to the UK, he was threatened that if he ever tried to tell the police that he had been illegally trafficked, he would never see his family again. Until he was treated as a domestic servant, and until years later, he was not able to communicate with his family. He, if he wanted to eat, he had to take care of the children. He had to cook for them, clean for them, and do everything for them. At the age of 14, with the new name that was given to him, he created his own identity. The old him completely lost that identity. He didn't know who he was. And at the age of 14, he created himself as an athlete. Let me read a verse for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not, to, not for disaster, to give you a future and hope. Here we can see that God always leads us through everything. 
even though he didn't know his name, he didn't know his identity anymore, he didn't know who he was because he couldn't see his family, he was taken away from them, he still found his new identity. Name is a very important thing for society. It's a very important thing for everyone. We identify, we identify ourselves through it. Since we're born, we are given a name. And through, as we grow up, we, become, we make memories with it, and it is what describes us, what defines us. But if we lose that, we essentially lose who we are because then we're lost. We start questioning, who are we? Who am I? Um, do I really belong? And then you start questioning everything about yourself. For example, in olden times, when slaves were forced to forget their name and they were treated so badly, they thought themselves to be equivalent to animals because they lost that identity. I remember learning history about the slaves, how they were treated really, really bad, and they were, they were brainwashed in a way that it was so sad that when, many, when slavery was over, many of them didn't know what to do with their lives because they were like, okay, we're less than you, then what are we? So many of them didn't know what to do with their lives. And then there's another example about the Nazis, where they would send a lot of people to concentration camps and would brainwash them. They would uh, make them forget their names, and then those people were degrading themselves now. They lost who they were. They didn't know who they were because they lost. They were like, then where do I really belong? Although now things are different, we're still surrounded by a society constantly telling us we don't belong. Who are we? Who are you? And as we grow older, God already has a purpose for us. Each one of us. He has an identity for us. But there's a very big fight between God and the devil. The devil telling us, no, you don't belong. No, you're not from here. Are you sure? Are you sure you're doing the right thing? And then there's God telling us, I want you to succeed. You belong with me. I brought you here. I'm going to take you to heaven. I'm going to take you to your house. This uh, fight, most society hears Satan rather than Jesus. So us hearing the voices around us, many of us choose to listen to society. And we lose who we are. We lose our identity that God gave us. We lose what is meant to be. And this leads a lot of people into depression because they lose their purpose. They lose what God gave you. And God, even if you lose that, God is still telling you, come, follow me. Come, I'll lead you through it. But many of us still choose not to and still choose to be blinded to that. Let me tell you another story. The prodigal son. There are two, there's two sons. The older one stays home and does everything the father says. Then there's the younger one who tells his father, I don't want to be here anymore. Give me all my inheritance and I'm leaving. Without question, he leaves. He thinks he's going to find himself. He's going to go out there and have an amazing life. And yes, for a time, he does have a really good time. He goes to the countryside and... He finds many friends and has a lot of money. He's enjoying life. But once all his money is gone, then he loses everything. All those friends, when he needs them the most, are gone. That fake identity that he created is gone. He doesn't have an identity anymore. So he's forced to leave. When he leaves, he's so hungry. He has no money to pay for any food, so he finds a farm of pigs. He sees food and he starts eating the pig's food and drinking the water. He sees his reflection in the water and realizes that even the servants in his father's household are treated better than this. He realizes at that moment 
that he always had a purpose, but he didn't want to accept it. So he decided, I have to go back to my father. I have to apologize. I made a huge mistake. So he runs back to his house. His father from afar sees him. He runs and hugs him. He calls for the big, biggest feast for a celebration. When the older son sees this, he doesn't go in, and he questions his father, why? Why have you never done this for me? I have always been here for you. And his father says, all that you see here belongs to you, so why are you mad? Here we see both sons that struggle with the with identity of who they really are. Neither is happy. The youngest, because he's not satisfied at home, and he doesn't see his real purpose. He's trying to find this fake identity where he thinks he's missing out on everything. That's why he spends so much money. He goes to the city. He makes fake friends. But when all of that is gone, then all that fake identity is gone. All those friends are gone. And he had to go through all of that to finally realize that his real purpose is to go home, to go where he belongs. He belongs to Jesus and not to the world. And then on the other hand, there is the older son who, yes, he doesn't go away, he listens, but also he's not happy. He always works hard, but never dared to leave. He was scared to leave. He wasn't happy. And we, not, we don't know what happened to the older son, but we do know that the younger son finally found his purpose as a child of God. Let me read you another verse, Isaiah 49.1. Listen to me, all you in distant lands. Pay attention, you who are far away. The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called me by my name. Since we're born, we already have a purpose, to be the children of God. We just have to accept it and not listen to what, every, what everyone else is telling us. So let me tell you a little myself. As many of you might know, my family is a missionary family, and we move around from country to country. At the age of seven, we've, I found out that we were moving overseas to Mongolia. At that age, I didn't know how much that was a change for me, how much that was going to change my whole life. At that point, I had only done one month of schooling in Bolivia. I thought my purpose was to go to an SDA school and eventually study in Bolivia, do my life there. That's why I thought I was going to become a veterinarian. That was, that was my goal in life. But that all changed when we moved. And, but when we went to Mongolia, it was like a really huge trans transition for us from a very like warm country to an extremely cold country. But it was okay. I was homeschooled for a couple of years and didn't really have many friends. And then uh, I still kept my goal that I was gonna be a veterinarian. I still thought that was my goal. Uh, for those five years, I prayed for a younger sibling. I prayed that my parents would give me a younger sibling, but they would always tell me, no, we're going to think about it, but no, I don't think it's time, but I would, keep, I would keep begging them. And then came my little sister the last year that we were there. We were so happy. But, but then came another call to go to Nepal right be before my sister was born. And then they were given a choice. Since the 2015 earthquake in Nepal happened, they were given a choice to stay in Mongolia or to keep being a missionary in Nepal. My parents chose to go to Nepal even though my sister was just born. So the transition was a little more for us because we had to move all our things and yeah. Nepal, was a very interesting place. It was the, I went into sixth grade in Nepal. I was excited. At that point, I kind of changed my view and I was like, okay, 
maybe I'm not made to be a veterinarian, maybe not doctor for animals, maybe I'm gonna go for human. So I, I decided since my, my, both my parents are doctors, I was like, okay, I'm gonna become a doctor. And uh, I was put into actual school, which I was really excited about. Since there was no Adventist schools, I had to be put in a Christian international school. I went into sixth grade, and at that point in my life, I was sure I was going to graduate from that school. I was sure I was going to graduate, go to Bolivia, and become a doctor. To be exact, a pediatrician, a doctor for babies, because I love babies. Um, at school was extremely hard for me. I struggled a lot with my grades, but I still had to work really hard. I would see, like, my brother so sure of his, he had so many friends, he had so much, and then there was my dad, like, the director of Adra Nepal, he, he was, my family was doing great, and then there was me, lost. I was like, okay, I'm struggling here, I'm lost, I don't know what to do with my life. But I kept pushing. And then I also struggled like to fit in a lot of the time, but I still had my family there. At the end of our stay there, our, my third year, I, I decided that I was gonna shadow someone because I was like, I'm not sure if I wanna be a pediatrician. So I went to the Adventist hospital there and I shadowed a pediatrician. And by the end of that week, I was sure that I didn't wanna know anything about pediatrician. I did not wanna become a pediatrician. I was like, this is not for me. Children are not for me. I, I will take care of them, but not for life. No, this is just not my thing. So I kept questioning, what am I supposed to do with my life? And at that point, I did not realize that I have not once asked God, what was I supposed to do with my life? I kept questioning my human self. What was I supposed to do with my life? And that just led to more questions. Where am I going? What am I supposed to do? And then we got the news that we're moving to the USA. I never questioned my parents of when we're moving, why we're moving, but the USA, I really did not want to come. I did not want to move here. I really didn't want to know anything of this country, but it's okay. We still moved. The transition was a little hard, but it's okay. We moved. Um, we arrived on July 3rd, right before July, the 4th of July, which was interesting, very crowded. Um, I had to leave everything I knew once again, which was also a struggle for me, since I had made a lot of church friends and I was already fitting in, starting to fit in, and then I had to leave again. At that point, I was very not sure of what to do, so I decided, okay, since my parents are doctors, let me become a different type of doctor. But I wasn't sure of what type of doctor I was gonna become. But as I looked more into becoming a doctor, I decided, okay, no, 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 that's not my thing. So I looked into becoming a nurse. And a lot of the girls in Nepal wanted to be nurses. So I was still in between nurses and doctors. So I was very unsure, which I hated. And the summer before I started my freshman year, I started working at HVA. For the past four years I've worked, summer school year, I've worked at HVA. I dedicated my life at HVA and I, those four years passed really quickly. So I saw my purpose as, okay, I'm gonna finish, I'm gonna graduate here at HVA, and then I'm gonna go to Bolivia to, to go to college and university. But that once again changed sophomore year when my brother was a senior and we had to go to different colleges to see what he was gonna study. And then I started looking, maybe doctor is really not my thing because that's too much studying, too many years. So I looked into becoming a nurse, pre-med nursing, but that was too much for me. So I just decided to be a nurse, but still I didn't wanna be a nurse. Then came my junior year, mid-junior year that I was unsure to mid-senior year. I was so unsure what I was gonna do with my life. Then my brother told me, Ruth, I know about this career at Andrews, speech pathology, you should look into it. So I did. And I was like, 
this seems pretty interesting. This seems something that I would do, something that I would really enjoy working at. So I was like, okay, I'll look into it. And then I forgot about nursing, doctor, and everything, and looked into speech pathology. By the end of senior year, I finally made my conclusion that speech pathology were, was where I was gonna go at Andrews. And it, I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life, but yeah. And then I finally came to the realization that I had never once asked God, what am I doing with my life? What am I supposed to do? What is my purpose? I finally asked him, and then he told me, maybe speech pathology, but I still wasn't sure. And I'm still not sure, but I'm, I'm still gonna go with it. Since I was really small, I was asked a question, I was asked two questions. Where are you from and who are you? I always struggled of who I was or where I was from because yes, I was born in Bolivia, but I only lived there since from until I was seven. So I was like, okay, so I feel like I belong more in Asia, but then Asians would be like, okay, but you weren't born here and you don't look like us, so you're not from here. And I'll be like, yeah, but then where do I belong? So once I've been asked this question so many times, I keep, kept questioning myself, kept questioning my worth and kept questioning everything. The only connection I had to Bolivia was my family. But even then, sometimes they wouldn't accept me. They'll be like, you don't belong here. You're not like us, you don't talk like us. So I would keep questioning, myself, okay, if I'm not Bolivian, then where am I really from? Instead of looking to God to look for my identity, I kept looking at society, kept looking at the people around me to tell me who I was, to tell me my worth, to tell me who Ruth is because I lost my way, I lost who Ruth was. As a child, I was extremely close to God, but as I grew older, I became distant. And that distance just kept growing and growing and growing, and I lost the little voice telling me, you're my daughter. In Nepal, I was bullied a lot in school because of the way I looked, the way I was, and because my English was not good back then. And I would look at my family and be like, they're so successful, they're so successful. My dad being the adjunct director, my brother having such good grades, he has so many friends, they're just being so successful. And there, there's me. When people would ask my brother, where are you from? He'd be like, I'm Bolivian. And I'll be like, how, how do you know that? Because like, yes, we're born there, but how, how do you know your identity? How are you so sure? And he's like, I just know. It's, and then I just kept questioning it. I doubted myself for so many years and I fell into a very deep depression of, and I lost my purpose. I lost who I was. I wasn't happy. I didn't know my path. I lost everything. At that point, I had to find a safe place or else I would go everywhere. I was a mess. So I found my family. But even then, they wouldn't be able to answer my questions. They wouldn't answer any of that. So I was so tired of keep questioning of who I was. I, as I grew apart from God, I just was so tired. So one night, I just, knelt down. I just crying and I was like at 12 in the night, God, what am I supposed to do with my life? I don't know who I am. I don't know where I belong. I am, what, where am I supposed to go? Where is this? Who is Ruth? I don't know this person in front of me anymore. And God just simply said, you are my daughter. I brought you into this world. I chose you to preach my word to other people that are struggling. I chose you. Your purpose is to be here. You don't need to belong in a country. You belong to me. You belong in my kingdom. You don't need to be born somewhere to belong there. Since then, I still struggle with my identity and I'm like, where am I really from? But now I know I am the daughter of God and I belong with him. So I don't need to belong physically somewhere 
to be his daughter. Um, I still struggle fitting in, but I know that I can always look at God to bring me back. So whenever I want to go back to that place, I know he will always bring me back. Let me read you one final verse. Jeremiah 1, 5. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. I have found my place as a daughter of God. It's your turn. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, help us all find our place and where we belong. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much for the special song and also Ruth for the message was very powerful. Thank you so much and God bless you. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs uh, chapter 3 verses 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled up. It will be filled to overflowing in your vets will brim over with new wine. God has been so good to me. And I'm pretty sure that he's been also good to you. And we have the privilege of showing gratitude to him as we are faithful through the tithes and offerings. And before we have the closing prayer, we will have the opportunity of demonstrating our gratitude and faithfulness to God through the offerings and also the tithes. I'd like to invite the, the deacons up front and we will have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we acknowledge that we've been so blessed by you. We don't deserve any of the blessings you have given us, but we praise your name for them. And now we have the opportunity of showing gratitude for all the blessings. And we ask the blessing upon this uh, money for the collections, the tithes, the offerings, that they may um, help to accomplish the mission to preach the gospel to all the world. We ask you these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, as we came to your presence this morning to worship you and also to, to receive your blessing, Lord, we came here as we are, as we were, and now, Lord, we, as we finish this service, we depart from here, but never from your presence, being reminded one more time that we all belong to you, that there is always a purpose in our life, and there is always a place for us in your kingdom. Lord, help us to keep this idea always in mind, to never forget where we came from and where we are going, and that we may always put our life in your hands and be truthful to the purpose that you have for us. We also pray, Lord, that you may use us so that we may go and share this truth with others and help others around us to find purpose in their life. We pray for those of our church members, for that part of our family, those who couldn't come today for various reasons, for health, for maybe travel or other reasons. We pray that you may be with them as well, wherever they are, and bless them, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.